Hello, everybody. It's time for episode 242 of the Three Point Podcast. We're teamed again with Sky Mint Cannabis, Michigan's leader in the industry. Over 15 locations throughout the state of Michigan. Make sure you check out the new Sky Mint Reserve. That's the good stuff. If you're over 21, go online at skymint.com. Sign up for the rewards program. And remember, Sky Mint is your one-stop shop for pain relief, help sleeping, or you just want to chill out. Sky Mint's Still offering the coupon code 3.20 at the Corona store. That's for 20% off Sky Mint products and only new customers. So go on in, tell them 3 Point Podcast sent you. We're also proudly partnered with Memorial Healthcare, home of the Now Community Wellness Center. Sign up, get yourself in shape, and a whole lot more. The 115,000 square foot facility features a full medically based wellness center featuring state of the art workout equipment, fitness classes, and an indoor track along with many, many other options. Memberships also include saunas, a lap pool, and locker rooms with private showers. For more details, go online at memorialhealthcare.org or give them a call, 989-720-CARE. Our other local partners include AZ Printing Solutions, Capital Sports Fieldhouse and Hit and Pitch, Crow Real Estate and Auction, Nelson House Funeral Homes, Rivals Tap House and Grill, Success Group Mortgage and Servicing. We want to thank them. And we should have a fun pod as uh, we'll talk, obviously, catch up. We'll talk football, football, football. And we'll talk high school eight-man football with Kendall Crockett, the head coach of the Morris Orioles in our prep spotlight. But, fellas, let's catch up. And I got to believe Jared might have a few stories of his travels on the road. Let let me real quick mention, uh, I'm surprised you didn't slip this in, Ted. Today, we're recording on Wednesday, November 16th. There's an open house at the Wellness Center, at the Memorial Healthcare Wellness Center. So people can go check it out and see what it's all about. What did I see? It's from anyone listening. It's from 4 to 7 o'clock tonight. So that could be a cool chance to just go see. We've been hyping up the Wellness Center. Go see what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, the only reason I didn't bring it up, I wasn't sure when the pod was going to drop, but I I will be there this afternoon. I'm going to try to do a a special video to let everybody know what's going on so we can share that on our three-point site as well. Good good catch there, Matt. Sweet. So, yeah. All right. South South Beach. Did you make it down there? Because you were, um, you know, our listeners know you had this big trip planned. You, you flew on basically a puddle jumper. Hopefully the plane actually, you know, made it down there. But you were also like texting us the whole time. And you were like, you were like yeah. doing, you were like doing work down there. I was like, get off your phone and go enjoy South Beach. What are you doing? Yeah. Well, so it was, I mean, it was a great time. Um, I will say this of the one place I can't complain about or uh, one industry, the, the airplane industry. I mean, Spirit, no delays, no awesome. problems. Walk like got right through TSA the majority of the time, right to the flight. Uh, so no complaints for me. Got Chick Fil A at the Detroit airport. No <laughs> line there either. So no, it, it, that was great. Uh, but what I think I realized this weekend, and I've noticed it other places too, like Arizona. Um, there's just no no people like Midwest people, especially Michigan people, man. I mean, the, anywhere you went, the service, whether it's at restaurants, waiters, you know, Uber drivers, uh, just people in general at the mall, everyone's a jerk, man. The the, <laughs> the the TSA people at the Miami airport. Let me just first say this: the Miami airport is something out of like an apocalypse. Yeah. I was one. We got off of our flight, and I swear we had to walk two miles to get to our bags. Uh, on the other side of this airport to by the point have you guys ever like have your bags ever beaten you to the like carousel at a uh, baggage claim that's how far of a walk it was i think 30 minutes at least um and the ceilings in this airport are just i think maybe seven feet tall it, i i don't think joel and b could walk through these airports <laughs> airport which is weird it, it made you feel like claustrophobic the whole time you were in there um but anyway one specific story so on the friday night before the wedding uh the whole wedding party was going to BJ's brew house, uh, which is maybe a little bit of a weird spot to have like a, a wedding rehearsal dinner. Um, if you know BJ's brew house, they're, they're even here in Michigan. I, I knew there used to be one right across the street from me in Sterling Heights. Great spot. Uh, so we get there and, you know, first we put in our names uh, because we didn't, we, we were not a part of the wedding party. We were, in a, we had to sit separate from them. So they had a reservation. We just went there and put our names in. So we're waiting for an hour. Uh, they told us it was going to be 30 minutes, you know, 30 minutes goes by, 45 minutes goes by, an hour goes by. Finally, uh, you know, my potential, I guess, cousin-in-law, I don't know what that word would be, 
he goes in there like they finally like, beat us <laughs> after after an hour. Finally, so we're sitting down. So that's just the start of the night. So finally, this wedding party rolls in. You know, we're there for probably thirty minutes. Uh, we you know get our food. Everything's kind of going normal pacing. This waiter is, is a little bit of a is a weird kind of teenage guy, probably twenty years old. Uh, you know, earrings. I don't know, just a kind of a, a snarky teenager. And every time, and every time he comes around to take our order, he's got an iPad. So I kid you not, it's taking like ten minutes to go through these orders because every time you place something, he's like typing it in right. manually every single time. So uh, it's whatever, not that big of a deal. We have a couple like weird moments. He's like constantly cracking jokes, and uh, he's call, calling me boss and all these these <laughs> other things. And it's the so, worst. So he yes. leaves. Uh, you know, we get our food. He gets us a gets me one beer. Gets everybody their drink. And we don't see him again. You know, 30 minutes goes by. We still haven't seen this guy to the point where, again, my cousin-in-law, like, he's been out of water. He's got this, like, huge steak. He hasn't had water in, <laughs> in like, 20 minutes. So he has to walk up to the bar to get it filled up. This place is, like, packed to the gills. Like, it's it's rivals for Michigan, Michigan State. That's how this place looked uh, on the inside. Uh, so finally, an hour, he comes back. I, I Like, we're basically, we have to wait for this wedding party, which, by the way, this wedding party, we're, we've not been there for an hour. They haven't even gotten their beer yet. They that's how slammed this place is. They they can't quite uh, they didn't quite plan for this huge group, which had been reserved for months. Um, so, so we're basically we were like, OK, we got to wait for these people because the whole plan was like we're going back to this Airbnb after this to as a group to you know party or whatever. So we don't really have anywhere to go. So we're like, all right, we'll just wait. So we when he comes back around, like everybody kind of orders a drink. 30 minutes goes by. No, no word. Finally, like 45 minutes goes by. I kid you not on this timeline. This is legit. 45 minutes comes by. He comes back. All right, I'm going to get you your beer. Okay. I'm like, all right. Like, okay. 15 minutes later, still nothing. He comes back. He's got, uh, he's like looking around frantically for, I guess he has this little like card reader that he lost somewhere in this restaurant. So basically he's, he can't work unless he has this card reader. Cause as I know, this iPad was basically his lifeline. So he's like flipping over plates, looking all over at this like booth we're sitting at, trying to find this card reader. He can't find it. So he just like frantically like walks away as he's walking away. He's, yeah, I'm still going to get you your beer. Okay. And then so now it's an hour later. He comes back and says, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to get you guys your drinks. We're like, at this point, we're just going to get out of here. So yeah, all right, whatever, man. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, so he comes back with the bill. The bill, the, all of our bills have the, the drinks that we didn't get. So then he realizes this and, and we're like, wait, I thought we weren't getting the drinks. Oh yeah, you're getting the drinks. You didn't, you thought you weren't getting the drinks. So then, okay, this guy clearly screwed this up, but just didn't want to have to redo the bill. So then finally he brings out the drinks and like we had our bill, fill it all out, hand this guy. He, he comes back like maybe 10 minutes later, right? As we like are basically forced out of this restaurant, drink this drink as quickly as you can. He comes back and he asks us for our bills and he, I kid you not, he analyzes these bills like right, <laughs> right in front of us with how much we tip. I tipped him, I think, like ten bucks. It was I think it was like right around fifteen percent. Usually, usually I'll tip you 20, 25 percent, but it was, the service was so bad that I just I gave him ten bucks. So then we're walking out. I'm going to the bathroom. He like flags me down. Of course, I forgot to sign this this bill, so I have to then <laughs> sign this thing right in front of this guy. Who just said this kid had just no shame? So I sign it, hand it back to him, and I was on my way. But that was not like an isolated incident. I felt like that was the majority of the weekend. I had instances like that. We had an Uber Uber driver who uh, could not find our Airbnb, uh, and little do you know, I get into her car. She's got like a Ted's old 2005 GPS still hardwired in her. <laughs> <laughs> like so, we had to, I had to, literally the solution to that story was the my cousin in law had to jump this fence jump in the Uber with her and then a leader like a mile or through this route back to pick us up. So it was just, it was a lot of kind of crazy moments throughout the weekend, but it was a good time. Might be, <laughs> but might it be was a long, good time. Might be the longest restaurant story I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> uh, that's the highlight of your trip was the terrible service. Oh, wow. I mean, have you hey, ever, man. have you ever, uh, maybe it's just like, maybe I'll do a good job explaining it, man. This kid was the snarkiest kid you've ever <laughs> You've ever laid your, your eyes. I mean, out. I can picture it. He, I don't know. Maybe you were a big, big group of dudes. So maybe he, you know, didn't really care as much. Didn't think you guys were going to tip him that much or, you know, maybe something like that. You know, you, you guys look like easy targets to like not care about, but the, the yeah. brew house thing, 
it is funny how a lot of them have like changed to like the iPads, even other restaurants too, but brew houses that have like 700 things on tap or whatever. Mm -hmm. And right. When they, when you order your one beer, sometimes they've got to be like trying to find it. It's like, just give me a Miller light. Like, I I don't even care. Just wherever this thing is on this iPad, just find it. You know, I forgot the best part. I I didn't even get a tip. I I didn't even get a bill. He he said he couldn't print bills at the end of the night. So I just had to hand over my card with no, no idea what this charge is going to be. And I just have to trust this guy. Of course it's like 75 bucks, which made almost no sense, but just had to roll with it at that point. I'm surprised they separated your guys' bills. Right. Yeah, Let me ask you this, table. Jared. How many were at your table? Uh, five. Oh, five. Okay. Because so just a tip, on, maybe you've run into it before. A lot of times when there's multiple people at a table, usually it's eight, they build the tip right in. And then you can you can give them additional tip, but you got to look up. You got to yeah. watch that. Sometimes you you hit them a full 25% after the tip's already in there. Yeah. It's you funny know, you say that because when we were at Disney last weekend or two weekends ago, uh, that happened. We went to a, a character dinner, you know, with Mickey and all mm-hmm. them. And, uh, I got the bill and I didn't look at it. It was a pretty hefty bill, but yeah. the 20% gratuity was built in. So I filled it out with right. a nice tip because being a cast member, you know, I don't want to make sure. myself look bad or anything like that, of course. of course. And usually, you know, I'm a pretty generous tipper also, if the service warrants it, you know, you give, give a good tip. Yeah. But as I'm filling it out, I'm glad I looked because I would have like double tipped this guy who was right. a fantastic waiter. But, you know, you don't need to give him like an $80 tip or whatever. But yeah, you so, got to keep an eye on that. Other than other than the restaurant and the Uber, Jared, you know, if you can shorten it up a little bit, how was the wedding? I mean, like Matt said, you're texting us contest that you want to play. I, I texted back, said, what's going on? Didn't you make to the well, wedding? I mean, dude, Are you, you, you know how weddings go? You're, I mean, they, I mean, at some point in the night, you're going to end up sitting by yourself on the corner on your phone. Uh, if you're not. <laughs> not the weddings I've been to. I don't know what Me weddings neither. you go to. <laughs> no well, I, dude, I mean, if there's a, if there's a seven hour wedding with your uh you know your girlfriend's family like you're not going to be sitting there you know hamming it up the whole time or at least if you are you're a crazy person uh, or you're some social butterfly i, I guess i'm I guess not I'm a crazy person me so, too uh yeah i guess i'm wrong i guess i'm crazy but was your girlfriend was it, in the wedding jared no no was the so wedding you guys were the, just there. i know you said the wedding wasn't on the beach but was it like it was in the, the middle so I don't know where we were at in uh, it's homestead. It's like, yeah. it, it must be like that farm community. There was a million like tree nurseries within, um, I felt like 10 miles of, of our Airbnb. Uh, it was like, it must be like fertile land or something, but basically this wedding was in the middle of a, a nursery, mm-hmm. uh, koi pond running through it. You know, the, the string lights all over it, glass, uh, you know, like glass. Oh, that's house. Awesome. It was the coolest venue I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. big old barn it, it, yeah it was really cool wedding was awesome uh but, literally there was a at one point i posted on my a snapchat a, a surprise appearance from some guy wearing like a 10 foot like light up electro man like dance suit <laughs> <laughs> so that right. was uh, definitely a highlight um but yeah it, it was it was a great time yeah if you ever go to homestead again i've been there it's south miami really really south of the downtown area by about 45 minutes to an hour you weren't really that far at all from the florida keys you know from homestead just keep heading south yeah well i'm glad you had a good time young man and uh a good time at the wedding you know and uh safe travels and props out to spirit airlines any other final highlights before we move on to something different no, uh, no, I, I mean, it, it, the weather is, is always, it's, it's always hard coming back, man. I mean, I, it's right yeah. as I came back, it, we're getting slammed with snow right now. Yeah. Looking out my window, it's snowing. Commute's going to be out. I was going to say, my, my sister sent a picture yesterday. Um, I guess it was a built-in day off, uh, for actually Morris schools. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk That's about awesome. Morris again yep. pretty soon, but she sent a picture of her son, my nephew, you know, excited because it was snowing and, uh, so she, you know, she said, you know, he's, he's excited, you know, day off school and snow. And it's funny, my wife and I both replied, you know, it was a, a group text with my family. My wife and I both, re- both replied like, oh, is it a snow day? <laughs> and, you know, because we're in the, you know, we're already acclimated, I guess, to North Carolina that, that basically any dusting of snow is going to be a snow day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my sister said, no, it's not a snow day. You know, it was, it was a built-in day off of school, but you know, it is snowing. 
but it is crazy because I think the, up north, I mean, obviously the UP has been getting snow already for a couple of weeks, but I'm pretty sure my parents up in Ludington, at, they got like six inches or something, in, you know, yeah. some areas over there. And, you know, it's cool. My, my you know, because we still talk, I know I've talked about it on the podcast. We still talk about moving back to Michigan. And when we see stuff like that, my, my wife texted me and she was like, does that snow make you want to move back to Michigan anymore or <laughs> less? And I was like, I love the snow, but it's only mid-November. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, a long a, win- it's a long winter for sure. Yeah. Uh, I can't complain too much. I mean, we had a good run this fall. We, we got a lot more fall than we normally do. So, yeah. you know, it kind of was, it kind of was just expected at this point. So now you just roll with it. Yeah. Well, and, for- until Easter. The, the nice thing for me, boys, with the snow, uh, my hot tub was l- delivered this week. We've nice. uh, been in it a couple times. I'm, I'm enjoying life outside, man. It's nothing like getting in the hot tub when there's snow on the ground and it's cold. 104 oh, yeah. degrees in the tub, man. I love there it. Is, there, I mean, obviously, a hot tub is cool. I, I like hot tubs. They're, they're cool year-round. Mm-hmm. There's, there's nothing better than in the winter. Like you said, when it's snowing, especially if it's snowing and, you know, there's snow around. Right. And you're just sitting there. Oh man, that that is that's the life, especially on the lake too. Oh, I think a couple margaritas are happening tonight, so that'll that'll be fun. You know, and speaking nice. of the snow too, you know, we're going to talk more about high school football in the prep spotlight. You know, I did a couple games last weekend on Z925. We did the the uh, New Lothrop game, fun game to do, but then Saturday we had to go 2 hours up to the thumb to do Fowler and Ubley. And let me tell you, You know, these little teeny schools like that, they were very friendly, but they had like three local radio stations and they said, no, you guys got to be out in the stands, you know, so we're sitting out in the stands, it's starting to snow, Uh, we're sitting underneath the PA speaker and we hook up our equipment and of course, the Verizon signal was no good, so we had to zip over to my cell phone, Uh, you know, I have a different service. And it came through. It was okay, but I think the PA man was blowing us out of the water every time I didn't have something to say. So that was a long day right there. (laughs) At Uh, least it was an afternoon game. So, I mean, if it was a 7 o'clock kick or something like that, that would have been rough. And you guys know me too, man. I've been doing it a long time. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we're in the middle of the stands in basketball or we're in the middle of – football stands, eh, I do have a bit of ham in me and I have no problem entertaining the crowd around us. So it was fun. All the people were really friendly. I did want to mention this too, before we move on to more stuff. Uh, Last week I talked about Veterans Day and, you know, our relatives in the, in the service. I forgot. um, I don't know what he would be called either. He's the husband of my niece, but I'll just call him my nephew-in-law, Matthew Quick. He's an ensign in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer currently in San Diego. And Matt, you know, I, I reached out to you because my sister was trying to see if there was any way he could get tickets. He was running into a roadblock with the military. And like I said, he's an officer in the Navy. He finally was able to score tickets. And after the game, after the, the game on the uh, on the uh, the ship, you know, where they lost a close one to Gonzaga, uh, he got a chance to meet Tom Izzo. So oh, nice. got a nice picture with Izzo and uh, it all worked out real well. But again, want to salute him for his service in the military. Yeah, that that is cool. I'm, I'm glad they were able to get tickets because, uh, you know, when, when people have asked before about they know I work at ESPN, not that I have some crazy poll at all ESPN, right. but, you know, right. they ask like about tickets and it's like I can ask around. And like I texted you guys that tickets for that, you know, on the USS Abraham Lincoln out there in San Diego were pretty uh, VIP, I guess, you know, pretty, they were keeping them pretty tight. So I didn't think I was going to be able to just all of a sudden hook them up with tickets, but you know, I figured I'd ask. So when you sent those, I I was glad they were able to. Yeah. And and the, the only catch, he got it through the military. The only catch was he had to wear his his dress blue uniform. Everybody there was all dressed to the nines, you know, in the military. And, you know, before we move on, I mean, we're going to talk maybe a little college basketball before we get too far along, but how cool is that setting? I mean, you know, oh yeah, just amazing. It is. I I hope they continue to do it, which I'm sure they will. Because I would think so. It's one of the coolest college basketball, especially for these games in November that frankly don't mean anything. You might as well do something cool. Neutral sites on a battleship. I mean, man, it, Cool. Yeah, it, that's got. I mean, I, I I I still to this day now I have a new one to watch. I wa- I'll watch like the full game record of North Carolina versus Michigan State eleven eleven eleven. I mean, mm. one of my my favorite regular season game 
yeah. uh, ever played. I mean, that was cool. And this one, same exact setting. It was, yeah. it was just incredible. I mean, Mark Hollis, Michigan State's former AD. I mean, you talk about a guy who was a real visionary with this and the Champions Classic. I mean, you got to give him credit, man. I mean, he was a hell of an athletic director. Oh, he really was. The, the he, biggest. Go ahead, Ted. I was just going to say, I thought he got kind of railroaded just because of the whole Larry Nasser thing. You know, I thought Hollis was an outstanding athletic yeah. director. That's yeah, that. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> well, right. no, yeah. Yeah. I don't need to get, I, it. We don't need to get into that. that. No, I, who, know, who knows? I know what, what you're saying. Was yeah, I know what you're saying. In the basketball sector, he was right. good at that that aspect of helping yep. the program. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I, it's funny, the the Champions Classic, because, um, you know, down here, Duke, North Carolina, that's all anyone talks about, really. People last night were, because last night was the Champions Classic with Duke, Kentucky, uh, Michigan State, and Kansas. No North Carolina. And there were, I was working last night. Some Carolina fans were like stuff that maybe me and Jared would say, how the hell is Michigan state in the champions classic? <laughs> and I had to not Jared. I mean, you guys, I, I don't remember all the specific details, just that Michigan state basically started it. And I, I kind of explained that to him. Like, you know, this, yeah. this whole thing was kind of Michigan state's idea. So that's kind of why they're in it. Yeah. And, but and I also had to take a shot. Like, yeah, I don't get it either. Their national title was 22 years ago. <laughs> And I've, I've said before, you know, there's times we laugh like they don't deserve to be in it. But, hey, they won it this year. So you can't say that for at least 365 yeah. days because they won their game this year. So no, they, they, I, I'll take a shot here. anytime. Anytime I have a chance, I'll take a shot at Tom Izzo and Michigan State. But they're obviously one of the best programs in college basketball. So they deserve to be there. Eight Final Fours, right? So yep. they, they've got something to say. Look at Ted's not even going to say anything. Ted's well, no, okay. you, you always had you always had your bets trying not to piss off Sparty fans. You, you, <laughs> you send a dig, then you go, but that, that's what cracks me up. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, though. That's how we operate. All right. Hey, we're going to talk uh, some eight man high school football here in the state of Michigan as uh, the state finals are coming up this weekend in eight man and the uh, semifinals in 11 man. And we'll have the prep spotlight presented by Capital Sports Fieldhouse right after this. Well, next up on the podcast, uh, presented by Capital Sports Fieldhouse, it's the Prep Spotlight, and we have very successful coach of the Morris Orioles eight-man squad, Kendall Crockett. And Kendall, uh, the season maybe didn't end the way you wanted it to, but still, you had a lot of highlights this season. You've had a lot of highlights over at Morris, especially since the Orioles went to eight-man football Thanks for joining us here on the podcast, and uh, let's talk about, to start with, this year's Orioles squad. Uh, you know, overall, uh, 15 kids, 14 that could suit up over the course of the season and there at the end. Um, we lost over 10 seniors last season, all of which started on the offense and defensive lines and offense and defense in general. We lost our 2,500-yard rusher, Wyatt Wesley, so we had to replace the entire offensive line. We had to replace the entire defense, except for one, uh, two players. So we went into the season kind of with a bunch of question marks, not knowing what we were going to do. Um, it took about four or five weeks before we figured out the actual offensive line that we settled on and finished with at Menden. Um, obviously a much different dynamic than what we were last season, but overall we were a very fast team. We were small, but we were very fast. And what we did do, we did effectively. Cool. Coach, can you, uh, for, for the listeners, even maybe, you know, some other people uh, checking, checking out the podcast, just give us a quick rundown of the difference between eight player and 11 player football, other than the simple eight players versus 11 players. Is it, you know, a lot of play calling differences or, you know, can you just break that down for us real quick? I think uh, the biggest difference that you'll probably find if you watch both uh, fashions of football you play to your strength. If you have a quarterback uh, like Colin, uh, they had Simon Vinson, an amazing quarterback. They threw it to Wiki, uh, who broke all kinds of state records. Uh, two years ago, when we played them, they were a, an option-based program. Uh, they had a really a smaller quarterback that couldn't throw as well, but they were awesome at doing the uh, the option. When we our second year, we had a quarterback Nick Hart that could throw the ball. Uh, we throw for, through for over uh, 2,000 yards, and then we switched our offense because we didn't have any quarterbacks coming through. I think 11-man programs with the number of kids that they have are more fortunate or more apt to have the same offense in place year to year. 
Whereas eight man, you have to kind of figure out, okay, we can't throw the ball next year because I don't have a quarterback coming up until, you know, four years from now. Sure. So you have to kind to kind of change the offense and the defense, depending on what kind of players you have there as well. So I, I would say that's probably the biggest difference. I, we actually had the opportunity to talk with uh, Simon Vincent and Justin Wickey and their head coach, uh, Robbie Hatton. We're doing a story on them for the uh, state finals this year. Uh, and he said uh, with eight man, he said offense comes easy. He says it's, it's not that hard to put up points. He said that the defensive side of the ball is the hard one to coach. He said he always feels like he's a guy short on defense. Uh, do, do you agree with that statement? Does Is defense kind of the, where – your, your bread is made when it comes to eight-man football? Yeah, if, if you can't stop anybody from the defensive side of the ball, you're, you're not winning eight-man games. Um, at least you're not going to win probably a state championship or go right. deep in the playoffs. Um, our 2018 team, we gave up around eight points a game. Uh, <laughs> we were scoring around 40 to 50. Wow. And like Robbie said, you're always one man short because an 11-man, you have that high safety. You can roll them over the top. You can do different coverages. You can run cover two. You can't run a lot of the coverages you can in 11 man because you're minus that one extra uh, right. body. Hmm. But yeah, you're going to, you're going to win more games than you lose. If you have a good defense, um, you, linebackers are key. Obviously your defensive ends. Uh, if, if you catch a seam in eight man football, for the most part, you're gone. Uh, if you have a fast running back, like we had Hunter Nowak a couple of years ago, Wyatt Wesley uh, last year, if you, if you catch a seam, you're pretty much going to go to a pay dirt. Whereas in 11 man, you have that high safety over the top that can kind of come down and fill those alleys. Kendall, you talk about Wyatt Wesley and it's kind of like the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. You know, you had a chance to win a state championship. I want to get your thoughts on what that felt like, you know, making the trip up to the superior dome, that whole experience. And then last year, you know, you guys had a heck of a team and that had a, had to be a bitter pill to swallow with that L at the end, huh? It was, you know, you go into and you break a lot of records uh, rushing wise. You look at the offense, you look at the offensive line. Um, and that's what you say to yourself. Like this, the only way that you lose is if you beat yourself. Mm -hmm. And which quite honestly is something we, we talked about that entire week. I thought we had, I thought we had by far the better football program than Colin that season. Um, they came in, Colin came in, they played a heck of a game. But overall, when you lose a game like that and it becomes final, that that's the end of your season, you you kind of go and you, you have to find something else to do yeah. for a couple of weeks because obviously you're not coaching football at that point. And it is, it's a tough pill to swallow because I knew whoever won our bracket – our side was going to go into and probably beat Augre, which mm -hmm. Colin did. And that was your ticket to going up north to the Dome. And then when you're sitting there watching Colin play um, North Powers, and all you're thinking in the back of your mind is, that should be you, that should be you. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're saying, well, it's not, because <laughs> we didn't hang on to the ball like we should have. Right. Uh, definitely. When you're saying that, yeah, this is 20 years ago, but I had those same feelings when we lost in the second round of the playoffs. So I, I can definitely, I can, I can feel what you're saying. Uh, yeah. One more question for me, coach. Uh, let, let's talk about Morris, like the community. One of my sisters married into a family that's deeply rooted in, in the Morris community. And uh, now they've got one, their son is going to be coming up. So maybe he might be playing football for you and, 10 about 10 years 10 or 11 years he might be playing football for you but um the morris community how how big is it to have that backing and you know the support and just a community like morris that you know is all, all about following you guys around they would have followed you all the way or they did when you made it to the dome they would have followed you all over you know wherever you took your team how, how big is that for the players and for you to see i mean it's always nice to when you're doing something that you love doing and the kids are doing the same. It's always nice to have people there to support you, win or lose, to support you. Um, and it's just, it's nice to be able to, you know, go to a home game and see that your home uh, crowd is there, that the the, the uh, stands are completely packed. And we travel well. Uh, mm -hmm. We just packed the stands when we went to Menden this last week. Um, and played them. And that was a, that was a, hard fought game for us and we held our own for a bit, but I mean, Menden just kind of took it to us at the end, but yeah, the, 
the Morris football tradition is it's strong. I mean, I'm looking at the football board right now for league champs. It goes all the way back to 1956, hmm. and there's about 10 of them up on there. Uh, we've been really successful the last, uh, well, eight of the last nine years um, as an eight-man program. And, you know, we just want to keep things moving in the same direction they're going for the, the kids that are coming up from the elementary school. Well, I want to go back to the uh, state championship for a second. I've always wondered this when it when it comes to eight, eight player. Um, how do you like the Superior Dome as as a state championship setting? Uh, let's say that we could move, you know, the eight player cha- player championships to Ford Field on Thanksgiving weekend. Would you rather play in Ford Field, or, or is there something special about that place? You know, a lot of people. I mean, it totally depends on who you talk to on this. But for me, I think the experience up at the Superior Dome is really second to none. They do a great job up there. Sorry, I'm yeah. plugging something in real quick. No, nope, it's okay. Um, the overall experience going up there, you know, playing in the largest wooden structure dome in the world. I think it's the only wooden structure dome in the world that they play in. It's a neat experience. And and traveling on the bus, you know, the eight-hour trip up north, stopping halfway around Mackinac, getting some food, things like that. Yeah. Overall, the experience for the entire team, the entire um uh, community is just it's amazing and they do a great job up at that facility yeah i agree with you uh, kendall uh, i've done a handful of games up there including state championship games and in fact in fact i think we did your uh, your state championship up there but uh it is a great facility uh you know I, the whole trip with the team it's a team bonding thing it is really cool but the question i have for you is uh, I don't know if there's been talk about it. You know, I know you guys in eight man football play one less playoff game, but is that, has there been any talk about that uh, semifinal should be at a neutral site and not, you know, at the, at the home team with the more points. I mean, I thought that was a little bit unfair. I think it should be the same as 11 man and neutral site on turf. Yeah. Um, I think a neutral field would obviously be good for both teams. Uh Men would probably disagree. They probably enjoyed having home field, as would I if I had home field. But um, moving forward with the teams that are coming in, I think we're getting about five to ten more teams this year. And when we get those teams in, maybe when we start getting bigger to the point where we're like a Division Eight or a Division Seven, maybe we start following some of the the parameters that are set in place for those other teams. All right. Well, we're going to let you get back to your hall monitoring duties. It looks like <laughs> uh, I got to send a shout out though to well, we'll call you Mr. Morris Football. No question, your success over there has been unparalleled. I think, uh, Mr. Morris Sports though, Andy Flynn. I got to send a shout out to him. He's an old timer like me. He lives and breathes Morris Athletics, and uh, I know he's been a big part of of stuff you do. Right? He's he's at every event. It's not just football. And he's done, he's done stats since I've been here uh, coaching with Brad Long in 2007. Mm-hmm. So he's always doing football. He do, does the girls, boys basketball. Yeah, he's, you want to talk about who Mr. Morris is, that's hmm. absolutely Andy Flynn. Well, listen, Kendall, we'll be watching you further. I love what's been going on over there at Morris. I mean, the Field of Dreams is looking great. They got the press box finally installed there. (laughs) You know, everything's moving forward for Morris Orioles uh, football. We hope you're there a long time. We'll be checking in with you periodically. Thanks for the time today. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks again to Kendall Crockett for joining us to talk a little Morris Orioles football. And speaking of football, uh, we got one team standing from our area, New Lothrop. They surprise, were, surprise. The yeah, New surprise, <laughs> exactly. They uh, they took care of business at Hornet Field, 26 championship drive on Friday night, downing uh, Elkton Pigeon Bayport, Laker, 29 to 20. Their quarterback, Jack Kalhanek, yeah, he's, he's having a nice year. You know, two good junior quarterbacks, really, that we can point to. You know, both Kalhanek and obviously Wyatt Bauer of Corona. But Kalhanek had three touchdowns in the air, over 200 yards, and then ran for a touchdown as well. And uh, they got a big lineman, goes both ways. Jaden Curry had 17 tackles. And Jeez. speaking of big, I don't know if you caught any of the game. Laker was with their backup quarterback, and this kid – was a 250-pounder. Quarterback oh. was uh, Ethan Wisner, and he just ran the shotgun, ran power plays to himself almost the whole game. I mean, he was a load. And New Lothrop did a pretty good job uh, physically with him. It was it was a fun game. Was the 
was that just a strategy because of the backup quarterback? Like, would they be passing Laker if they had their starting quarterback, or is that just the offense they run? Not as much. It was it was still similar offense because they ran the shotgun, uh, and they would direct snap it to the running back to his right or left every once in a while as well. But uh, he was the main load. You know, he th- he threw a nice deep pass, but I think he was 0 for 11 on the game passing oh. the ball. <laughs> so. <laughs> So New Lothar pretty much had 11 guys in the box. You know, yep. we, talk, we did talk about this on the broadcast, guys, and I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, Clint Galvis, obviously, you know, one of the real top coaches, not only in our area, but in the state. You know, we talked about, you know, he runs such a multifaceted offense. And when you're seeing that at basically a class D school, I mean, that, that says a whole heck of a lot. And they, they the other team doesn't know anything what they're going to be running at them i mean it's just all you, over the place i've been in the booth before when you're watching it man you are mesmerized by by their offense it, it, it is smart man it's it's simple stuff a lot of motion um he, he he loves to dial up the trick plays which in high school man i mean those those will score almost half the time mm-hmm. uh yeah it, very advanced offense and it's smart and he keeps it it looks like it's very complicated but it's just a lot a lot of the same stuff just out of different formations misdirection and like really it doesn't have to be like trick plays it doesn't have Mm -hmm. to be like the triple reverse running back pass you know it it, sometimes in high school if you can execute it that's obviously the big part all you have to do is like a little misdirection in motion like you said jared and yeah you're going to throw the defense off even in the playoffs even against some of the best teams in the state because you know you can't really prepare for it but we've talked to clint galvis coach galvis on the podcast a number of times and I'm just always so impressed at the commitment to the program that the players have. Cause Mm -hmm. you know, just thinking back to my time, you know, you you think about your experience when you're talking about this 20 years ago when I played, we were very committed. We were for sure. I'm not trying to shortchange anything, but we also, a lot of us played multiple sports or to be honest, a lot of people, you know, were farmers or, you know, had, had other things that they were very committed to and, to hear coaches like even John Webb with Durand, you know, talking about the commitment that the players have, you got to have that. If you're going to run an offense like that, you can't just like in July be like, Hey guys, we're going to, we're going to throw this offense at you. Let's, let's see if we can get it by our first game. You know, so it it is impressive. Well, as Jared said, I'm, I guess I'm mesmerized by it. I didn't realize I was, but (laughs) I was just sending out props that, you know, here, this is a class D school. Yeah. A lot of misdirection. A lot of different plays. I mean, they started off the game, guys. They were down 6 nothing, And first play from scrimmage, they ran play action with a faking a, a counter play. They had a kid so open. I have never seen this before. 25 yards open on just a, a, a post pattern over the middle of the field, and the poor kid dropped it. The pass was oh. right on the money. I've never, but they bounced back from that. But hey, Clint Galvis, I'm going to say it again, too. Uh, great coach, obviously. He picked up win number 144, tying Nick and Nice all time for second in our area. Trails only Byron's Roger Bayshore, who has 157 career wins. Galvis is going to destroy that. Yeah, right. And on top of that, you know, I went down, had some pregame chat with him about, you know, keys of the game, that type of BS, you know, broadcasters have to get. And uh, I, I was walking away and I turned around and said, hey, by the way, how old are you, Clint? He said, I turned 40 tomorrow. So he turned You're 40 really? on Saturday and got his big win there for a birthday present. So that's pretty cool. That's impressive. Wow. I mean, I, I mean, he's you, still young, you, but I would have guessed he was like, thir- like 34. He's just, he's so, <laughs> yeah. he's so energetic and like, yes. he just would be a blast to play for. I've always thought he that. Would be. And no I know doubt. we've asked him on the podcast and maybe he's just not telling us, but um, we've asked him, you know, if he has college aspirations to, to coach in college or, you know, anything like that. And he's mm-hmm. told us, at this point, no, you know, he's happy at new Lothrop. He's got his kids coming through and all that kind of stuff. So he's got a good thing going there. I mean, if you got a program built like that, why to an extent, unless you want to coach in college, why would you want to leave? I mean, well, you know, you're right. It could happen down down the road. Who knows? He's 40. So it could happen 10, 15 years down the road. If you wanted to make a move and you know, I got a backup question on that too. Cause I, the, the superintendent of schools, Anthony Berthum came over and chatted with us a little bit at halftime. I asked him specifically that question. I said, Hey man, what do you think? Is uh, Clinton going to stick around here? And he says, Oh yeah, he'll be here for Mm -hmm. a while. His kids are here. He's happy. You know, things are going good. So that's cool, man. Yeah, you talking about somebody uh, who, if he stays, if he stays coaching as long as he possibly can, he will, he will win 
he might win this the set the state record. I, I if he Possibly. coaches coaches until he drops. Yeah. 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 Well, it's definitely well, impressive. And uh, you mentioned their opponent coming up. They're playing uh, up Traverse in Flair, City. But they've, they've got a tough game coming up, right? Yeah, number one in the state, Traverse City, St. Francis. It'll be a repeat of, I think, 2018 when they played. New Lothrop picked up the win in that one in a hard-fought game. I mean, the, the stat that just totally jumps out at everybody is, you know, Traverse City, St. Francis pounded, you know, number three, Ithaca, 63 to nothing. I mean, wow. think about that. It yeah. was, I think it was 50 to nothing at half. Wow. <laughs> it's incredible. So the Hornets are going to have their hands full. You know, I, I got a feeling they're going to be ready. Can't come right out and say they're going to win, but uh, you don't, you know, they saw that score too. And they're going to say, nobody in the state, nobody in the country would believe we can win this game. And they'll, they'll have that chip on their shoulders, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to talk a little uh, football, college and pro again. All our teams won last weekend. We'll get into that right after this. All right, guys. So we posted it on our Facebook page, and it, it's been a back-to-back weekend. Ted, I think you mentioned it in the open yeah. of posting three wins by the Spartans, <laughs> Wolverines, and Lions. We don't get that very often. Someone always Polar eclipse, man. Someone yeah, always flips end of the world. Up, you know? <laughs> but uh, to, to start off with the Lions – I mean, I think I know where you guys stand because you 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 made your feelings well known either last week or you know a couple of weeks ago when they were when they were losing some games. Anytime the Lions can win back to back games against division opponents, Packers and Bears, like they've done, I will take it. I understand the whole lose, get a better draft pick, you know, try and build a program, try and build up your team. I think that's true for maybe a team like the Packers, maybe like the Rams this year, even though the Lions have the Rams draft pick. But, you know, they won the Super Bowl last year. Maybe they're a little down. Let's lose. Let's try and, you know, build up for next year. I don't I don't subscribe to that narrative with the Lions. They need to change their culture. They need to change the same old Lions mindset. They need to start winning games like they did against the Bears, which we've all seen since before Ted could grow a mustache. They usually lose those games. Anytime they're in a close game, they lose those games. They need to start winning those games. When Justin Fields was breaking 27 tackles on that last play of the game, trying to throw, I was like, they're going to lose this. He's going to throw a dart 60 yards down the field, and the Lions are going to lose this because that's how it's always gone. They need to start winning games like that. I don't care about the draft. They need to start winning games and get people in that locker room saying, this is not the same old Lions. We can actually beat Justin Fields. We can actually win those games. And then maybe some free agents will start sliding in. Maybe some people will stay buying in for 17 games instead of being checked out by Thanksgiving. I understand the draft side of it, but I, I want to win. I want to see the Lions win games and change that same old Lions mindset. Are you, are you guys still saying lose out? Or what, no, uh, Here's where I'm at. If we beat the Giants next week, then this would have been worth it. Uh, if, it if we beat them next week, I mean, we're, we're hot. We're rolling into – Thanksgiving Day against the Bills and one of the more anticipated Thanksgiving Day matchups that we've had in recent memory. So if we win this and the Lions are on a three game winning streak rolling into Thanksgiving, I'm for it. But uh, if this proves to be just a, you know, a facade, which I think it most likely will uh, this weekend against the Giants, then it's just it's just at the end of the day, it's just affecting our draft uh, capital. I don't hate the idea of winning a couple games. I'm always going to be there because uh, to root for it, because I love these post game uh, Dan Campbell speeches. Uh, so I'll root for it, but I think the thing that my biggest takeaway from this weekend was, and a lot of people's this you know last few, five weeks has been Justin Fields. I mean, he's going to be a problem to deal with for for the foreseeable future, uh, and that's just a little bit unfortunate. Kind of the Bears were the one team that we thought we kind of had the leg up on uh, in terms of kind of building for the future, and it doesn't look that way anymore. I mean, he's incredible. Most most yeah. most rushing yards by a Q, QB in the Super Bowl era the, these last five games. I mean, 178 yards a week ago, 142 against us. Uh, I mean that one run he had. He's he's it's it's incredible how fast he is. I mean, is he faster than Lamar Jackson? He's if he's not, he's got to be pretty pretty darn close. He's electric. Yep. Yeah, he's the he's the one of the new faces of NFL football. That the prototype quarterback you got to have nowadays. And then you know, let's face it, Jared Goff's not going to be the long term solution for the Lions as well as he plays periodically. I give the guy a lot of credit. He came into a tw- tough situation. He's doing okay, but they definitely need to upgrade that position. I will say this back to your original question, Matt. I'm kind. Of, I'm definitely leaning more your way. I mean, yeah, 
psychologically to me when they lose, that's when I go, well, let's keep tanking so we get top pick. But no, every week I watch the Lions, I want them to win. Mm -hmm. And I I think you hit on it perfectly. It's the mindset. It's Mm -hmm. the SOL. They got to get rid of that once and for all. Look look at this team. And I've said it before. You guys have heard me. You might disagree with me. I do think they got some decent young talent. They can't stay healthy. You can't help that. If you you put a healthy team out there and you do still get some decent draft choices, I don't care. Let's say they they win some games. They win six games when you go through the whole season. They're still going to get a decent draft pick, even if they win seven. They've got the Rams who are faltering now. Cups out. So they're going to get two number one draft choices that are pretty high up. And they can continue to build. They got to, you know, when you got guys like field fields in your division and some of these other quarterbacks, you better be focusing on defense. Yeah. You need a quarterback, but then you better focus on that defense and tackle somebody and cover somebody. And Jeff Akuda pick six. It looks like he's going to be a decent cornerback. Keep solidifying that D and get rid of that, that silly mindset. What was it? Somebody was saying, was it Peyton Manning and uh, Jeff Daniels uh, working on getting rid of the curse? Yeah. I mean, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Two game winning streak, you know, feeling pretty good. And like Jared said, Dan Campbell at the press conferences, sounding good. He wants to go home, drink a beer. He's so exhausted. Did you see him and the defensive coordinator do the chest bump after that game? Yeah. This team, this team's together still, you know, yeah. they love Dan Campbell. And that says a lot that might, you know, that might be good. Even it will overcome some of his coaching flaws that maybe he'll get better right. at. And that's my thing. Like, no, like I, I get what you're saying, Jared. Like if all of a sudden they lose to the giants, lose to the bills, then we're like, all right, what, what was the point of beating the Packers and the bears? I, I guess my thing is no, they're, they're not going to make a super bowl run. <laughs> even right. if they somehow get back into the wild card hunt and somehow sneak into the playoffs, you know, this is not a playoff winning super bowl contending team. My point is kind of like what, what Ted was saying right there. How how many times have we seen them lose those games? And then by Thanksgiving, the locker room falls apart. You can tell mm-hmm. teams are checked out. You know, guys are just basically load managing like players do in the, in the NBA nowadays, you know, just sitting out games or whatever. At some point, that's got to change. Like how many times do they tank for a high draft pick? They draft a guy high, TJ Hawkinson, and then they trade him away a couple of years, a couple of years later. It, it doesn't work with the Lions. It works with teams like the Packers, like the Steelers, you know, teams that have like a program or whatever in place where they can ha- kind of have a bad year and then turn things around quickly. The Lions haven't turned things around since the curse of Bobby Lane, you know, <laughs> so they need to start winning. They need to change that curse. They need to start showing people we can close these games out against the Bears. Justin Fields, even though he had that crazy touchdown run, and it's, it felt like it was going to be an SOL game, then they closed it out, and they actually won. Like, I mean, I'll, I'm not saying this team's a Super Bowl contender, but it's, like, positive stuff. It was fun. Positive vibes are always a good thing, and I, I will gladly take that over them drafting another tight end in the top ten. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when you mention all these this young talent, I, it, Hutchison's really – starting to come around. I mean, that pick six Okuda had it happened because Hutchison made a great play, right. Uh, recognizing the screen and kind of shielding uh, fields from the receiver. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm all right with the positivity as long as we're winning, but I just, I don't be shocked when, you know, we're sitting here in a week and basically all we've done this year is, is ruined our draft capital. Right. Well, go lions. Hashtag 57. <laughs> now, Speaking of Aiden Hutchinson, um, you know, obviously, played at Michigan last year are we uh you know sitting at number 10 and 0 last time they were 10 and 0 was 2006 and we know how that season went are, are you know they've got Illinois this weekend who clearly Illinois was overranked I mean they they should handle Illinois and be set up for an undefeated matchup again with Ohio State at, uh in Columbus are, are we are we getting a little nervous that one that they might slip up against Illinois this weekend or two that like this is you know, how, how like it last year was like a dream season for the Wolverines. Is this season even looking better? You know what I mean? Like for hey, whatever reason, it seemed like last year was a lot more fun. And yeah. I guess that's kind of sad because we just, we were looking for a winning season like that. Uh, you know, we are dying for it. We finally got it now. You know, we've almost accepted it already somehow. And in a year, we just expect it. Uh, 
as far as the Illinois game, just just handle business. I don't care yeah. if it's a one point victory. Don't mm-hmm. show anything special. You know, keep everyone healthy and just get ready for Ohio State and just yeah. win it. Uh, because if we lose to Ohio State, at least it'll solidify that we're going to be you know playing a New Year's Six Bowl and a, and a great bowl game. So just win that, knowing that if you do, the consolation prize will be very sweet. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can't speak enough about this defense, uh, especially in the second half. You know, the uh, last five weeks, I mean, outscoring their opponents 117 to three. It's crazy. It's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know if it's just because they're so well coached. I mean, there's not really one superstar player on this defense, just a lot of really good players that work really well as a unit uh, compared to last year where we just had a couple of really good pass rushers in Hutchison and Ojabo. I mean, we'll see when they're really tested against Ohio State. I think the secondary can hold up. Uh, but uh, time will tell. I just it's a lot of fun to watch them. They seem like a really close unit, uh, and it's just cool when you see a team that's well coached like that. Yeah, yeah I like what Harbaugh is doing. I mean, you know, a lot of people are obviously making the comparison to Bo. You know, run the ball, run the ball, and pick up wins. And they're ten and zero. They look good. I will say this: I am a little nervous about Saturday. This is way you know the cliche is out there, but this looks like a true trap game. I mean, yeah. you know, with Ohio State in front of them. I mean. What is the definition of a trap game? A good opponent prior to your biggest opponent? It's a little scary. I will yeah. say this. It, it, it amuses me to see all the people on social media, especially the diehard Michigan fans. Oh, we're going to run it right up Ohio State's throat. Oh, we're going to do this to Ohio State. If you think, well, let's put it this way. If you don't think that this is a 50-50 game at the yeah. very best, Going into Columbus, you're nuts. It's going to yeah. be a war. It, the it's only reason is that it's an away game. Yeah. That's yeah. the only right. I don't know. I, I'm seeing they put out the spreads for kind of like what these the spread would be on neutral field, and I think Ohio State's still like a five point favorite. Mm-hmm. I don't under and they and, I, and Ohio State's only a one point underdog to Georgia. I, I, I don't under or I think actually Ohio State would be was favored against Georgia, right? Uh, or or basically a pick them. I don't understand this infatuation with Ohio State. What have yeah. we seen this year? Right. They, I think the offense was better last year. I, and maybe the defense is a little bit better, uh, but I just don't understand it. You know, if we do lose this game, it's just going to be because, uh, you know, playing on the road is, is almost impossible in college football. I don't think it'll be because Ohio State is straight up a better team, but I could be proven wrong. I mean, they've definitely done that to us a few times in the past. Right. It does. It does feel like the home field will be big, obviously, for Ohio State. I'm not thinking we're about to have a. Blake Corum runs for 300 yards type of thing against them. I feel like other teams have probably done it too, but I feel like Ohio State, given what happened last year, how Haskins and Corum just ran all over them, and seeing what Corum's been doing this year, you would think Ohio State is going to say, we can't let Corum run for 250 yards. We're going to make J.J. McCarthy beat us through the air, which, you know, he's been a last few weeks a little inconsistent through the air. You would think that might be the mindset, but no, like the, the, the confidence. Yeah. I, I feel pretty good. I think Michigan, because of the stats you laid out, Jared, for their defense and you know how the offense has looked, the offense has been fine. You know, a lot of people criticizing mm-hmm. JJ McCarthy, like really he's still playing well. He's not turning the ball over. He's hitting the passes when he needs to, but no, Ohio state's going to be ready. I mean, there, I don't think it's going to be any sort of blowout. I don't think we're going to see complete domination. I, I could be wrong, but I think Ohio State's going to play, you know, a completely different game than they did last year in Ann Arbor. And, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I I think the same thing. It's a coin flip, you know. But I'm kind of with you, though, Jared. I I don't get the infatuation. I mean, it's Ohio State, so they have the tradition or whatever, but they haven't shown anything that's more impressive than Michigan or, you know, obviously Georgia or anything like that. Yeah, you and you mentioned JJ. I mean, people people hate on him because of his he didn't have a good looking stat line, but I mean, eight drops uh, mm-hmm. last week. Mm-hmm. This wide receiver room, we talked about how it was a strange yeah. going into the year. I think it's the worst unit on this roster. They yeah. are they have no speed, man. It's like they're running in quicksand. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just it's a little bit depressing, and that's definitely going to be I think what our eventual downfall will be, whether it's against Ohio State, whether it's maybe against a Georgia. It's going to be that these guys just can't get open. Yeah. Well, who's their who's their third running back? He looked pretty good. What's his Stokes. name? Yeah. Don't you think, I mean, this is just a thought that comes to my mind, and I don't think it's any big surprise, with the weakness that Jared's talking about right now on the, the wide receiver room, which I think uh, talent-wise they can improve and they can right. step up any given game. But don't you think we might see a little bit of Donovan in the game with Corum and, and run routes? I hope we have That's some what very... I get. Yeah, Jared, you mentioned it a few weeks ago. Like they've said on the broadcast that Harbaugh's always said, like, 
Donovan Edwards would probably be our best wide receiver right. if he played wide receiver. So put him out there. Like if you're if you're yeah. saying that, right? Like put put Corm and Edwards in the backfield and do some of that. Yeah. Maybe they've got that in the bag. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I would. I, it, it would be nice to know if they are just saving that for Ohio State. A couple right. special, special formations where yeah, Corum and Edwards are on the field at the same time. I mean, it's got to be all chips on the table. Uh, yes. If he's playing every snap, it's so be it. Uh, and he's maybe not taking in quorum's playing every snap at running back, so be yeah. it. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's just let it roll. And that the Stokes kid, I know he, he's a true freshman, so you know it's always if he. I, I feel like I've heard he's like the fastest kid on the team, and you can see it when he when he runs the ball. He's got some speed, so yeah, he's north you know, and south. There, yeah, there's something going there, but I just they they've got to beat Ohio State, and if they do it again. You, you have to give Jim Harbaugh some props because, you know, this is his fifth 10 win season since he's mm-hmm. been at Michigan. And obviously he could win more this year. He He's turned this program around. I mean, Ted, you've watched a ton of Michigan football. Are, are we kind of back to the glory days of Michigan football where oh, yeah. they're, they're going to win eight, nine, 10 games every year. Absolutely. And then maybe, maybe every couple of years, you know, they actually contend for a national title you know, and then maybe they lose to Ohio State or Michigan State. But like, as far as the program, he's got this program like set. Mm-hmm. We we know who Michigan football is under Jim Harbaugh, and yeah, he's lost assistants. Lost. I mean, think about like I think DJ Durkin's had like four jobs since he's right. been under Harbaugh. So, uh, yeah, he loses assistants. It, it doesn't seem to matter. Almost seems like they've been getting better and better. Yeah, yeah. and as long as they keep the nil money coming too, you know, yeah. I mean, they're gonna they're yeah. gonna bring kids in. That's just an unfortunate thing that they got to stay on top of. <laughs> what do you guys think about the future of the Big Ten? You know, with the addition of the the, the two schools out west, and I think there's gonna be more. Are they gonna get rid of the divisions? And I hope just, so. Just yeah. play a schedule and then have the two best teams play for the or have a four team playoff at the end of the year, something like that. I don't understand the, the need for divisions. I right. I really don't. I, why? Why? It's it, and you see the result. I mean, I, every week I feel like they post the standings on ESPN of like the Big Ten West, and you just look at it, and it's it's a it's it it makes you angry because you know that the Big Ten championship game there's gonna be no hype around it, mm-hmm. uh, which it should be very hyped. I mean, I, I remember Michigan State versus Wisconsin. I mean, what a great game that was way right. back in the day with Russell right. Wilson. We haven't. I feel like we've rarely gotten the two best teams in that game uh, since that game. It will be interesting to see what they do. I, I think there's like a reason that there has to be divisions for scheduling or whatever, but you could easily just have everyone in one big division and just, mm-hmm. you know, do the schedule that way. Rotating but, schedule. Yeah. Right. Rotating schedule. Keep the couple like rivalry games or whatever. But are, are you guys they, sitting they need down? To change something up because if right, you guys are, if you're sitting down, man, you're going to be shocked at this statement. I'm okay wow. if they don't play Ohio State at the end of the year. Wow. How about that? Like at all, or you're saying no? Like, play them, maybe play them, but not at the, not the week twelve or whatever. If that's their like concerns, they don't want. If that's like the big thing, they just want don't want Michigan, Ohio State playing each other. I, why? I don't understand that thought. Let's like if you were them, I mean that would do so many numbers on television uh, ratings and revenue. Why would you not like do everything in your power to basically have that be a rematch every year? Well, yeah. that's why you got yeah. That's why you got to get rid of the division. Even if they play yeah. each other unbeaten in the last game of the yeah. season, they play, play again, again in the Big Ten championship game. I'm I'm okay with that. It's the same thing as 2006 when it was one versus two, yeah. and Michigan lost, and there was the whole debate of do they turn around and just play again in the national title game? I mean, they turns they out all... that was that was the right decision not to have them do that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. The bowl games that, <laughs> that was the start well. of the SEC dominance that yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, that was it was ugly for both teams, but it'll be fun. I mean, and we all know it's all about money. You know, Absolutely. we say it with a lot of things and the the ratings, as long as Ohio State and Michigan take care of business this weekend, I can't even imagine the ratings that are going to come in for that, that big noon kickoff for Fox, oh wow. Michigan, Ohio State, two mm-hmm. versus three, because Georgia is yeah, probably still going to be number three. one. Yep. Right. So it, it's insane. It'll be awesome. Well, you know, uh, we've been sending a little bit of love to our friends over at East Lansing as well, fellas. Before we wrap up the podcast, uh, again, Mel Tucker comes up with another win. I think you tweeted it, Matt. I mean, they're they're real close to being bowl eligible. And, you know, if they get to a bowl game and win a bowl game, man, this tough stretch of the season for Michigan State is going to be kind of washed away. Yeah. It- it will. Uh, I mean, we've talked about that state football team. I think if you're a Michigan State fan, you want to hear us talk about this basketball team with a <laughs> we got left. So I think they're okay with us just going to them. I mean, watching that game last night, yeah. Uh, Tom Izzo was vintage man. He was dialing it up at the end of that ball game. 
And, and a lot of people kind of criticize, have always criticized his whole timeout t- technique. I know we were talking about it before uh, the pod. I've been for it. You know, I maybe wasn't in like 10 or so years ago when you had so many seniors on the floor. But nowadays, I mean, you see it in, the, at, at, at March Madness every year. These last second shots are just the point guard dribbling around at the top of the key and then hoisting one from Steph Curry range. Uh, I love the idea that he's been calling these timeouts. He had a perfect, you know, blob underneath the rim, uh, gave credit to his assistants after the game. And then we saw that uh, the full length uh, inbound play to send it to overtime. I mean, just beautifully dialed up. Kentucky, the guy on the ball, perfectly fell for it. Mm-hmm. Thought he was throwing the ball inbounds and it gave him enough leverage to, you know, go over the top. I mean, Great and then play. my last thought on this game, uh, Suzoko. I mean, I didn't know who he was until the season started. He's been very impressive. I mean, yep. 16 points, eight boards, three big steals, a couple of that game in overtime and big time play, plays was guarding, you know, best player in college basketball. Did about as good a job as you can. I mean, he's just that good. Uh, so I've been really impressed with him. So I, I he's a good player. Good, man. It, it's a, it looks like a classic Izzo team where at least right now they don't have like the one Cassius Winston type of star. They've got mm-hmm. a bunch of scrappy players, you know, a few players who obviously, obviously stand out. Like, you know, you're mentioning the whole ranking thing real quick. They, they should be ranked. They, they yep. shouldn't have been unranked coming into the season. So the whole, like, Michigan State's unranked. Just if you if you don't want them to be top five, put them at, like, 18 or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's kind of like what the whole Michigan State's unranked. They, they, they're going to be ranked now because they almost beat Gonzaga. They beat Kentucky. So they, they're definitely going to be ranked. It's a good team. And, you know, Izzo, as much as I take shots at him, I, I still don't like him as a coach. You know, I just don't, don't like his style or whatever. But he obviously can coach his tail off. And – the whole timeout thing real quick. I mean, that's just, I, I like seeing, I like seeing coaches trust their players. You know, I, I understand calling a timeout. Let, let's, let's draw something up, but I think it, you know, it, it allows the defense to get set too. Obviously it worked out last night for Michigan state against Kentucky, but you know, the, the whole, um, I don't know, draw, draw and plays up. Kentucky didn't do it. And Calipari is a great coach and they obviously did not execute their plays. The whole, the, the play I was going to mention where you where they threw the ball, like across the, um, the out of bounds line and they threw it from out of bounds, out of bounds. And then they went for that. That's straight out of the John Fattel. That's straight it out is. of the John Fattel playbook, man. We, Frank we, Davis. Ran, <laughs> we, we ran those exact same plays. It was, it's funny to see that. I'm, I'm pretty sure your, your dad, Jared would, would admit that. I think yeah. he stole plays from Tom Izzo. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure, but yeah, no Spartans well, will be good. And real quick, Mich- Michigan's looking pretty good too. I think Michigan's got a solid team. They've, you know, with Dickinson and some of their young players, Michigan, Michigan state are going to be two good teams this year. Yeah, Jet Howard, baby. He looks like he's a keeper. Yeah. You know, like he might he might know what to do uh when the coach tells him what to do, right? Yeah. And I will say this back real quick to to, to my viewpoint on the timeout. I think I'd go probably 85% of the time coach's got to call the timeout. That's just me. You know, okay. sometimes it's a feel when you have, like you said, a good guard like Cassius Winston or somebody else and let it go. But I I would say the majority of the time you call timeout. That's what you're paid for. I mean, you get a lot of money, right? You know, diagram that play. And Izzo, you know, he's one of the. But best. you've been getting you've been getting a lot of money to coach them up in practice too. That's true. So they true. should be they should be prepared for a moment like that, right? Very true. But uh, <laughs> Izzo is probably the best there is at diagramming a play and coming out of the huddle and, and the team run it successfully. You I'm agree look, with I'm that. I'm looking in your I'm looking in your man cave right now. Do you have an Izzo poster back there? Or you know, oh, do you have an Michigan Izzo, State uh, books here? Maybe, but I. I <laughs> I love Tom Izzo. Don't get me you, wrong. You know that. You, uh, when Izzo hangs it up and he writes his memoir, I'll, I'll be I'll be reading it. So, Amen. oh, oh, for sure. I, you know, he's. I take shots. He he's obviously a legend. He he's a hell of a coach. And if he was Michigan's coach, I'd probably love him. That that's probably part of why I don't like him because he's that's fair. That's, yeah. that's totally fair. All right, guys, let's get the heck out of here. It's been a fun podcast. This has been the Three Point Podcast presented by Memorial Healthcare, home of the Now Community Wellness Center. Sign up, get yourself in shape do a whole lot more great facility i mean fitness classes indoor track a whole lot more check them out online at memorialhealthcare.org or call them up at 989-720-CARE we're also teamed with SkyMint cannabis michigan's leader in the industry many locations throughout the state check out the new SkyMint reserve the good stuff go online at skymint.com sign up for their rewards program and don't forget at the corona store use our coupon code 3.20 for 20% off SkyMint products for new customers only. We also want to thank our partners, AZ Printing Solutions, Capital Sports Fieldhouse, Crow Real Estate and Auction, 
Nelson House Funeral Homes, Rivals Tap House and Grill, and Success Group Mortgage and Servicing. This episode of Three Point Podcast recorded at StreamYard.com. And don't forget Thanksgiving weekend after that big Michigan win over Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Watch that at Rivals. Then check out Chi Town afterwards making a hometown appearance. It's going to be jam packed, a lot of fun. And uh, come on out. This uh, Saturday afternoon, 1 o'clock, New Lothrop taking on Traverse City St. Francis. Uh, that'll be a, a big matchup, a tough task for the Hornets, but I think they're up to it. And you can hear that game on Z92.5.com. So that'll do it. Until next week, so long, everybody. Peace and love. Be kind. Thanks for listening.